Welcome everyone to our panel discussion on eliminating common barriers to contribution for more inclusive communities. My name is Georg Link. I am the director of sales at Biturgia. My interest in barriers to open source communities is, well, it started with my first engagement back in high school when I joined my first open source community. But then now today we have the chaos project where I'm one of the co-founders and we're always thinking about how can we make it more welcoming, more inclusive, bring in new people. So that is, that is my background, how I'm approaching this topic. And we have three experts on this panel today, Anita, Mariam, and Daniel. And why don't we go in that order? Well, thank you, Georg. Hi, I'm Anita Sarma. I'm a professor at Oregon State University. Um, I got into open source research because one of my passions in research is understanding coordination and how teams work together, the collaboration involved. And open source is this mega, mega large co collaboration across, you know, completely geographically distributed people. So how does it even work? And the more I started looking at it, the more I realized how awesome, complicated software people are making and this coordination is happening through all these online challenges. But also I realized that there are so many barriers and challenges that newcomers face when trying to contribute. And as we have progressed like through the last 10, 20 years of 10 years of my research and 20 years almost like when open source is getting more into the mainstream, more and more open source is looking like for skill development and as career uh, progression. And one of the things we noticed was there is a diversity gap, right? Especially if you look at one diverse dimension, gender, women are pretty lowly represented in open source projects in general. And this became a cause of concern, one, because as I said before, open source can help with skill development and career progression, and we are leaving behind the women who are not participating here. The second problem is uh, research has shown that diversity in thought, which comes from diversity in teams, leads to more innovation and more productivity. And if we have this diversity gap in open source, it means the products would be even more innovative and more productive teams if we had diversity. So that's what got me interested. So I have been looking at onboarding challenges that newcomers face, as well as um, the problems with DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion in open source, and what we can do to improve. And that's what got me into this project. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam Huizani. I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University. Anita here is my advisor. Um, recently, I uh, completed my internship at Microsoft Research this summer, and my topic is, um, my research topic is on improving diversity and inclusion in open source. Um, so in general, I'm very interested in, um, on the topic of diversity and inclusion just as a general uh, field, but then uh, more specifically in open source where research has found where um, there's lower gender diversity, and uh, there are some barriers and challenges that could be uh, bettered. Um, so in my research, I try to both understand the state of diversity and inclusion, um, and also uh, come up with interventions to uh, make things better. Um, and I've had the pleasure to work with this amazing team for the past year and a half. And we've been uh, working with the Apache Software Foundation to understand their state of diversity and inclusion. Um, and um, I'm very glad to be here sharing our results, which have also been accepted um, as a paper at CSCW, um, the upcoming one. So, yeah. And finally, so this is this is Daniel Izquierdo. How are you doing? Um, unfortunately, I cannot be there, but uh, Marianne and Georg will be around. So my suggestion is that you ask them about everything of this research to make the most of the of the trip. Uh, I started in, in, in open source back when, when, I, asked, when, I, when I did my, my PhD, right? So my background is computer science and, and my PhD was related to free software engineering, empirical software engineering. Um, and then, uh, well, I'm, I'm one of the founders of, of Viterdia, currently holding the position of, of CEO. 
Um, then in, in this journey with with Viterdia and, and the company, uh, well, I, I was part as well as of the first steps of the of the chaos community. Um, and then in, in the chaos community, while back in 2017, 2018, that was the time as well where where we we had the opportunity to to start digging into into this topic, into the diversity and inclusion topic, specifically at that point in time with the OpenStack Foundation that we we had a project together sponsored or co-sponsored by by Intel, were uh, called OpenStack Gender Diversity Report. In case you you have certain interest, so at that point in time we were trying to bring numbers to have like um, you know to illustrate the uh, the situation at that point in time. Either because we were discussing about code related uh, contributions, non code related contributions, leadership, and so on. And I can say that these were kind of the seed for the chaos diversity and inclusion working group which is doing uh, great work nowadays um and that was my first time uh, learning about all of this topic and i'm, I'm still learning so i'm i'm a, I'm a learner here i'm i'm, I'm merely a, a listener um and this time with uh, with the asf project so as, as you said we we've been working together for a year and a half so more or less a couple of years ago we uh, we had the pleasure to meet uh, Griselda Cuevas at, at, that point, at that point in time were, was creating together with, with other ASF members the Diversity and Inclusion Committee and then this moved into the uh, VP of Diversity and Inclusion that in this case was Chris, the one holding the position and, and this is where all started, all of this research. Today we want to talk about barriers to contribution and what we can do about them. But I think it's critical that we take a step back and think about, okay, how did we learn about what those barriers are and how did we arrive at those recommendations? So maybe we can take a few minutes to talk about the process that this research project went through and to make it more interesting, talk about the challenges that we've faced and how we've addressed those? The, the process was um, in different phases, really. Um, so we can see here in, in phase one, so we had three different um, phases in our method. And we the idea was to um, have a rigorous process that also was involving um, the stakeholders. Um, so we wanted to have that feedback loop um, as much as possible. So for example, in phase one, it all started with this large um, survey where um, there was the phase of designing the survey. What are the questions that we're, we're, we're gonna ask? And have that feedback with the community to make sure uh, we're, we're covering all the questions we wanna, like we wanna have answers to. And but um, I, I think I will, I will interject and I will say even before the community feedback, um, one of the things that Daniel had mentioned already was Griselda or Gris uh, was really interested in working with us. So I actually met Gris uh, at OSS Summit in 2019, and I had done past work on DNI uh, on open source, and she she talked to us, and and Mariam and I were together, so we we talked to her, and she was really interested in getting a scientific understanding of the state of DNI in the ASF and then towards the scientific understanding of the challenges. And as a first step towards the scientific inquiry, uh, we wanted to create the survey questions itself that were rooted in academic uh, science, as well as uh, past best practices in, in past surveys that have been done. And so I went through um, uh, examples of survey questions that in this topic, uh, were presented in academic conferences. We pulled out the survey questions that were relevant. And then we also looked at past survey questions that um, the ASF had itself done in 2016. Um, the, the Stack Overflow survey, um, the GitHub survey, as well as looked at the best practices that Chaos had recommended about DNI questions that should be asked. So we took all those questions, we compiled a huge list of questions so we kind of went back and forth with um, Daniel, Mariam and I to kind of say what questions would make sense. Then we talked with Chris to see which questions would make sense and we had a short list. And then we presented these questions to the DEI community. 
And I remember there was a lot of uh, useful feedback and engagement, even at the wording level, right? So something that was really interesting was how international the community is. So one of the questions we had was about education background. And, you know, we, I had put college, undergraduate, we're using the American parlance. I'm from, you know, USA, Oregon State. And then lots of people brought up, like, in other parts of the country, what you mean by college or higher education might be different. There was a lot of interesting perspective of taking a step back and thinking about, yes, you know, as I said, this is a collaboration. It's a worldwide collaboration. What do these words actually, vocabulary we use? technical jargons or even, you know, this is not technical per se, but educational jargons would actually mean how they would translate to other parts of the country. So that was very interesting, I felt, having that kind of discussion. So, so. I, if anyone is interested in the survey, those questions are all there. You can replicate the research. Now, after spending so much effort on arriving at a really high quality survey, how did you go about collecting the data, engaging the community to get that feedback that you were seeking? Yeah, so, so just to add really quickly, um, this is research on open source. So we were very cautious about using also an open source um, tool for the survey. So we did use Lime survey in case anyone is curious. Um, and after all this work on designing it, we obviously want to publish the survey, but also communicate that the survey is there. And um, that was through the mailing list. And I believe, uh, Anita, maybe you can interject here um, other, other means where we um, encourage people to participate. So, so we did uh, two things. So it was mailing list. And one of the things, uh, since this was ASF sponsored, uh, we actually got the email uh, addresses of uh, ASF contributors and we emailed them. So I believe we emailed about 7,000 odd contributors, uh, but we also broadcast it on Twitter, uh, our accounts, as well as Chris's account uh, to get it as much uh, publicity as possible. Because one of the problems with um, empirical research that is data related research and survey is getting the response rates, right? If you have a very small response rate, one person or two person, it means only few people in the community have answered. So the data you're getting might not be reflective or representative of the broad broader population. So we really wanted to see how much um, breadth we could attend in getting in getting the responses. So we got 8.5%. It looks low, but actually all our past research and software engineering surveys of different kinds, uh, you get from 7 to like 15% response rates. So 8.5 is pretty decent from those books. I know that you spent a lot of effort on analyzing this, but I want to move on to the second part, um, the interview phase. Um, can you maybe talk about why was the second phase so important in generating the barriers and the, res the recommendations that we are talking about today? Mm -hmm. So, so the first phase of the survey is, so we got 624 uh, participants responding and we took those, um, that data and analyzed it, but that, that g gave us a broad view of what are the challenges there. Um, so I'll, just to go back really quickly, a lot of qualitative coding there with like tagging the responses. But then once we get, we, we got that, we got that data, we wanted to dig deeper. So we wanted to have more of a one-on-one -on -one interaction with um, these contributors, follow up with them, and really ask them more pertinent questions about these challenges. Um, so that's where the phase two comes in, and it's the interviews. The most important part was um, all the, like there were a lot of meetings involved where we really go through this data again and again. Uh, so it is a long process, uh, but we're also trying to have this final conceptual model um, that we can later refer to. So this so, was the phase of the, the interviews. And so one thing I want to just add to that is, again, this is a you know, scientific method that we wanted to do, and we did not want to come into the report or the analysis with preconceived idea. So we let the data speak. So this was grounded up from the data. So that's why it was a lot of looking at the data, the interview transcripts, open-ended text uh, responses, and kind of seeing what 
the community had responded and bringing it up. So the data speaks here. Indeed. Uh, I, while, while you were discussing about this here, I was checking the, the report. And, and I, I remember we, we, we had some big numbers here and more than half of the uh, respondents that we had in the, in the survey faced challenges. So in this case, the numbers, so it, this is it's exactly a 52% of the contributors to the survey have faced challenges. And this is, this is a really big number. This is more than half of the population we had as people answering the survey, which is uh, something to, to think about. And, and one tiny thing that there has been at least academic research and, and I have heard talks in industry uh, conference too, that it's really hard to make it into, right? How to become a contributor. But what we found was even existing contributors is 54% includes even those people who have three to five years of experience, right? Even um, people who are contributors who are making um, changes, they are still facing ongoing challenges. So it's not just entry barriers that are enough problems even once you enter. Exactly, and the challenge is just to add to that, um, when you progress within, within when be, while being a con contributor, when you get like more responsibility, there are additional challenges uh, that you start facing that you might not have faced before. So this was really interesting in terms of insight of like challenges that come out at the beginning, um, at the more like medium experience level and even at the very high um, level of being um, a member of Apache, yeah. I, I think we've established now that what we are presenting today is based on really good quality research with a big data set of um, just contributors from the Apache Software Foundation uh, and that barriers are really affecting everyone, regardless of how experienced you are, where you are in your in your journey of being an open source. And so let's start talking about the actual barriers and the findings. So in this model that we did, um, we have this framework now of categorizing these challenges. Um, so these higher levels and categories that came up from the data where um, we take a challenge and we see, well, what type of challenge is it? Is it related to the process of contributing to the, the whole process of being in an open source project? Is it something that's technical, that is um, about maybe uh, knowing a certain language that the project is using or knowing how to make a pull request or just setting up your environment? Is it something that is related to the social interactions and communications? Um, so we categorize them by type, like what type of challenge it is, but also by level at which they occur. Because some challenges are um, very proper to the individual. Like if I'm not familiar with Java and I'm trying to contribute to a project that is using Java, that is a challenge for me. That is an individual challenge where um, I'm not familiar enough with the language then there are like challenges that are um, relative to the project. Maybe, maybe the way the project is set up, the way, um, whether it has like a contributing .md, the way the readme is set up. Um, is or, or, or even the way uh, the project communication is being done, right? Which, which tools they are using. So it is basically um, tools, technology, processes that the project has uh, set up for its, its contributors that is where the problems arose. Exactly. And, and the third one would be the foundation level, which is which are challenges that occur more at the Apache Foundation level. And, and here you might ask, like, how would you know, especially for the levels? Uh, so for some, um, some participants specifically said what level it was at, they would be like, in my project, and they'd name the project and say what, what the problem was, or they would mention that it's a problem at the foundation level. If they did not, um, what we do is we think about who could fix this, who has the agency to fix this, and that's how we detect what level it's at. Um, so this is where, this is kind of like the distribution across uh, the categories and levels, and we ended up with a um, 88 challenges, a conceptual model of 88 challenges, yeah. So one quick note about this, um, it was like uh, one third all, right, this is pretty, um, 
well distributed. But if you can see at the foundation level, the process challenge is where the most people face, right? How does each project interact with the foundation, the Apache way, just understanding how everything works together at the foundation level, the kind of guidances, documentation exists. And if you look at the social part, that's where a lot of communication, coordination, collaboration happens. Um, larger majority of the social interaction problems are arising at the project level. So that's again where the project can do something to fix uh, some of the problems that we will be raising here. Uh, I wanted to, to highlight here that uh, we have all of these uh, types of, of challenges and we've characterized all of the activity, I mean, all of the, all of the barriers into this uh, different levels and so on. Um, but then I, I, I wanted to bring that at the same time and part of the interviews, the, um, the interviewees were uh, providing a specific mitigation strategies that they thought might be uh, useful to serve with the community and that, that are part of the report as well. Um, I, I wanted to, to mention specifically in this case that we can see here in the, in the picture. So we have the Something that was really surprising to me was the, the Apache way. So people were facing issues with Apache way while, while during, I mean, the, the, the Apache Software Foundation, my specific experience, and this is totally talking about me and my experience is that uh, it's, 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 it's clear how they work, but uh, it seems that people are still facing challenges when understanding all of this, the Apache way. Maybe this is because they are used to work in the open, but Apache Software Foundation has a specific, you know, ways of working, that, that meaning of the Apache way. Um, and most, and, and I was reading across the mitigation strategies, and I would say that most of the, the, the ones related to process uh, can be in somehow uh, mitigated or the strategies that were provided were mostly related to extra documentation, having a modern way of introducing the foundation to the newcomers um either if they are volunteers or those coming from uh, from from a corporation um training a specific training or maybe even provide clear uh guidance on the on the governance process and i would say that this we we characterize this as part of the foundation but if we if we think a bit more about this i would say that this is this is a an issue that should be addressed as well by the organizations because if you are willing to invest or contribute or participate in, in ASF projects, probably one of the main things that we should all do as a, as a company or, or any other entity is to, to help our own developers to understand how these open source foundations work. And it doesn't matter if this is the ASF, which is the research we are, you know, uh, talking about today, but there are other foundations that have, have a different way of of, of working a different idiosyncrasy, right? So, so that's my point. So there are, this is not only a, a set of problems that we want to highlight here today, but there are a bunch of mitigation strategies and that we can all help to advance into, you know, lowering the barriers to, to be part of open source communities. So let me, let me add one thing since you mentioned the Apache way, right? Um, what, what was interesting, and this is where, you know, where projects exist by itself or they exist within a foundation level, what is the governing principle? So the Apache way governing principle is, is very nice, is very principled and lofty saying that there is no one way, right? Apache way is all about democracy, right? Every way is fine as long as it's open. But because in the ASF, and this is becoming more and more, commercial companies, this is hybrid contribution model. We have commercial companies who are um, used to working a certain way and understanding what the philosophy the Apache way is, is hard to um, grok, right? How to, how to figure out what is it that we need to do if you are a company trying to get into it because every which way is right. So one of the uh, comments were like, we looked at it, we interpreted it, we did something, but then an ASF member came and said, no, this is not how it is done. The, I mean, they were right, but the company felt they were right too because they interpreted it. So, so while the ASF way is, is nice that it is open and is democratic, it is causing problem by its very openness and uh, fuzziness of what they expect. So I think this is something more and more we will see as we have more hybrid models coming in, more commercial companies uh, trying to contribute to, to open source. 
Yeah, and, and just to add to that, it's it's a tricky balance because you want to keep that flexibility, but you also want to give yeah. guidance for people who need guidance. So one way um, I remember from our either interviews or, or surveys, I remember um, some recommendations about um, yes, but you how about uh, mentioning some like some specific projects that were successful so that we can follow their footsteps uh, if we need that a more explicit guidance. Uh, with while keeping uh, the overall governance way flexible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Samples, I always love templates, right? If you give me a template, I at least know what a successful template would look like. And that's something that could be done to fix, right? It's not very high uh, challenge of getting some successful projects showcasing what they did. So I know we have in this, uh, from this research, identified more than 88 barriers or challenges and possible mitigation strategies. Maybe we can at least provide some examples beyond what of what you've already uh, mentioned. So, um, so these are some examples. So we saw earlier that like more of a tree diagram and you can um, go through the like the research or paper where we have kind of the complete, the more complete, bigger uh, conceptual model. Um, but as an example of like recommendations we found um, is um, first off providing for the process, the one we just saw for the example of the process, for example, providing ongoing trainings and best practices uh, for reviewing. So just making sure that um, you're, you're providing these regular trainings for people that need it or who wants to like freshen up on them or uh, you wanna have these updated um, trainings available. Uh, but what also people mentioned is the process of reviewing. So really being able to uh, provide how, how are you supposed to review these pull requests and what are the best ways to review them in more of a like a systematic way or have some sort of guidance available. Um, so that was something about, about the process. Um, for example, for, um, for the the technical um, challenges faced. A lot of people suggested using automated tools whenever possible. So you want to have like that part taken care of. Again, open source takes a lot of time. A lot of people are volunteering. So we want to really be, um, make sure we're uh, aware of that in providing automation whenever possible, but also incorporating those new technologies that are just making life easier. Uh, so so before we go into the DNI, the social parts, right? So these two are process and technical examples. Um, so it was kind of interesting. I think one of the interviewees mentioned, oh, um, the project I'm contributing to is still using SVN. Why can't we just move to Git, right? So uh, because ASM is so mature and some of the projects I have, have so long uh, been in, uh, in, I don't know, in production uh, that they are still using kind of tools on Jira, for example, that were new and latest when the project started, but they have kind of become dated. And this is a problem, especially if, I think this person was also a, a, a commercial, uh, like he was, he's an employee in a company and he's contributing to open source as part of that employment. So he's a paid developer. And um, the problem arising is if his, um, if the regular company and other, other projects, you know, are using a different technology tools, now a, another barrier for this particular contributor is to also learn or know, update and, you know, figure out all the nuances, idiosyncrasies of different tools. So that's just adds more overhead to the contributor, but it can also lead to more problems and technical hurdles or like mistakes made for the project itself. And uh, maintainers are so busy, right? It is, it is so difficult for them to find the time to approve this. And there's this trade-off, right? Sometimes it's just easy for me as a contributor to sit through it and do my old ways and just do it manually versus spend the time and the investment to update to a new technology that maybe the project doesn't know and the project has to prove. So there's this trade-off to see like how and where the time investment would pay off later in the future. So that's a conversation even my team, small team has about the newest and latest technology that keeps popping up nowadays. In, indeed, there, there was some discussion as well in the by the interviewees related to uh, to, to the time to get a response, to get a replay, um, how to get, uh, how, 
how to get let's say some acknowledgement that this happened that the the, the reviewer or the committer um, uh, you know received the the PR or that they that there, there, there is someone on the on the other part of the channel a communication channel that is is gonna do something with the work I've done in in the last uh, hours right um, and there was there were there were some barriers in that. Uh, uh, specific area about uh, you know not, not receiving a proper answer in place or not, not even without probably the the word proper but uh, delayed answer or maybe having not actionable um, and a specific uh, steps after you, you've reviewed something or, or you've been reviewed by others so there is there are some reception issues around that are are uh, are worth mentioning here all related to what you mentioned and, and this delay is usually a way of saying we are maybe uh, we have you know too much work uh, so we don't we don't reach to answer everyone here so open source communities you know each of them they have their own their own pace of development and and this is this is something that uh, it's definitely tacit knowledge that you learn by simply staying in the communities but by but at least yeah go ahead. But actually, Daniel, there is actually past academic research on newcomers onboarding that has shown mm -hmm. that the biggest reason or the biggest challenge newcomers had faced or people had stopped contributing or could not make it was basically the no response. I know maintainers are busy, but if, if someone has put in a pull request and they don't get any response, you know, that means the community or the project doesn't care about that particular person's contribution or worse, someone else might actually make the fix or make the contribution and this person's contribution gets to be obsolete, right? So this is, this is a challenge about the time the maintainers have to respond to incoming pull requests, but also non-responses means we are losing people who could make a contribution. Yeah, I agree with you, but there is there might be this discussion about uh, so we know there's how the community works and sometimes the the the, the point of this this takes time please don't get upset so so that's something that we uh, if you are part of a community that may happen so you don't get a response and, and that's okay under certain but, circumstances but then instead of not having any response maybe a right <laughs> way to say is like you know how how you know customer service when you call like you it might take yeah, 20 exactly. minutes to get a response maybe there should be something that says how long it might take to respond because otherwise it's very disheartening for newcomers yeah it's all about like open and having that open communication and just acknowledging which could take a few mm -hmm. minutes where you're saying we've received your pull request and we'll get back to you uh in two weeks or we're in the process of reviewing it just having that feedback uh especially for someone who's new uh, it yeah. might encourage them to, you know, not drop out uh, completely off the project. Totally. Yeah. So as as the facilitator, I'm going to encourage to move the conversation forward. I think this was really great. And, you know, on the panel, that's the kind of conversation that we like to get. Maybe we can move on to the next item here. Yeah. Um, so so to loop again with the, with the communication and the open communication. So. Um, this is important for open source, but this really just is important for industry. It's just important in general is to include minority groups in the DNI discussion. Um, and this was emphasized um, a lot because you're if you're discussing uh, like diversity and inclusion, you want to include these members. You want some rich diversity of thought, and you know, like you say, that is coming in. So you really need those voices to make sure you're going in the right direction. You can't discuss something without having those experts or the people that are most uh, close to the issue be there to, to give their voice, their opinions. And um, one, one quick thing I want to add is like, uh, we did get some responses saying that uh, diversity is important and everyone seems to be talking about gender diversity, but what about English fluency or, or like uh, people who are like in China? I mean, how are they able to communicate and be part of it? So one of the uh, things we have to consider is diversity is not just unidimensional, right? The different dimensions of diversity and how to include these minority groups in these kinds of discussions. Exactly. And these are insights you get when you do include these people. You can you can get insights about differences in cultures, about differences in languages, etc. Um, and another way is to promote minority focused online meetings. So it's really empowering when when you're able to have um, the, these connections and be able to have these online meetings. 
you can uh, build friendships there, you can network, you can also have um, someone to look up to who is maybe um, similar to you so that you can, um, they can give you advice, uh, you can discuss things with them. So this could be really important in, um, in open source communities, but just in general, having that um, be like having, having it be uh, to have online meetings, maybe to have people start their own uh, online meetings and, and have that community uh, come together. Yeah. I really appreciate everything that you have shared with us today on the panel. If anyone is interested in reading the research, please look up the uh, research that it was published. We also have, if you're looking at the slide deck, a summary slide. So feel free to download the slides for yourself. Now we're going to do one last round of um, summarizing what is our personal takeaway from this uh, panel conversation. So we know diversity is a challenge. We know there are barriers to contributing, right? There are at different levels. So there is there is a lot of problems, but there are also solutions, right? Because the community was so responsive. Everybody who you know interviewed, uh, we, we interviewed were, were very nice. They, were, uh, they had ideas of how to change things or how they individually are making changes. So there is a lot of um, possible solutions out there that we should bring up. And I think one of the things we need to do is how to um, get some best practices on the ground. Like the code of conduct is a fantastic uh, starter, but how can we have such you know best practices or how to do good reviewing practices, right? Those kind of practices, the resources that is common across different projects, foundations, so that we can all work together to remove these barriers, you know, one barrier at a time. So that would be my take. I would add to that, um, my takeaway on this is um, open source is a really, really great way uh, for, for, for individuals to just, you know, it's, a, it, it's out there, it's a way to just learn. It's very much an informal learning type of way. It's a way to build a community. It's a way to network. Um, there, it has so much to offer. And I feel like improving DNI and open source could have this gigantic ripple effect on so many different levels. On just like economically, it could help people get jobs and help people get skills. It could improve the the projects because there's more people in with different thoughts, different backgrounds, they're bringing like their own perspective. So it's really impacting so much. And sometimes it's just small changes. And one more thing I want to add is to just thank all, um, all the contributors that like answered the survey and all the people we interviewed and how responsive and excited they were about this. Um, and I really think that moving on, we will be able to implement some really interesting interventions to just move things a little bit further and start that ripple effect. Yeah, that's that's a, that's indeed a very good point. So I, I like to, to yeah to, to thank you to, to all of the people involved in the research, all of the community that provided feedback at the Slack at the very beginning for the survey during the, during the interviews, to, well, during the whole process, during the readouts as well. Um, um, this has been a really uh, great community work and really great experience um, and indeed something that I'd, I'd like perhaps to highlight from, from today's conversation is that open source is all about community, it's all about the people. Um, if, if you as an organization, company or individual are willing to, to be part of a community, to, to let others, you know, uh, be aware of the kind of things you are doing to be transparent, to, to play with the, with these kind of rules. Um, I, I would suggest that you have a look at, at you know, all of this research we've, we've done with the goal of lowering the barriers to contribution because you will accelerate or speed up the process of adopting the technology you are um, open sourcing or maybe uh, adopt, improving or speeding up the development process of, of other projects that, that matter to you for any reason, either because they are part of your tech stack, because you are running an OSPO, because you are adopting the technology internally in your development. So it's all about people, so take care of them. 
So thank you so much for joining us on the panel today. Thank you thank to you. Georg for uh, moderating and uh, keeping us on time and on tracks. And again, thank you to the ASF community. It was a pleasure working and Bitter Gia. <laughs> <laughs>